Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Tom LaHue and we're going to be looking at Enneagram Type 1s today. And we're going to be looking at uh, the story of your life. Now this information comes from this book. It's called Deep Living by Roxanne Howe Murphy. And uh, it's a good book. Uh, it's a pretty, you know, extensive book. But it's a great book about helping you see maybe some of your blind spots and what growth might look like for you. So we're going to dive into this. And uh, before we get started, just a reminder in the description below is a link to my website, TomLahue.com. I do um, offer Enneagram coaching, relationship coaching. Um, you know, sometimes you can feel in life that you've lost your your way, you've lost your uh, excitement for life, your passion for life, your enthusiasm for life, and uh, maybe uh, your relationships have gotten tangled up and there's, uh, you know, silent treatment or there's arguments and you don't feel like you have that close connection that you used to have. And I just want to say you're not alone. Um, there are people like myself and others out there that will walk on this journey with you. And the Enneagram is such a great tool to help us to see maybe some of the things about ourselves that we wouldn't pay attention to otherwise. So if you're interested in coaching, I offer a three month program called Present to Life and you can do a discovery session to see if it's a good fit for you. Check out my website and also I have a lot of on-demand courses and every once in a while I offer live courses on Zoom. I'd love for you to continue growing and learning more about yourself and the people that you love so that you can have the best life and best relationships possible. All right, so let's take some time and look at type ones. And I'm just gonna analyze some of the information that she says here in this chapter about type ones and talk about this little section, the story of your life. And just, uh, you know, talk about it. Just think about it. Um, I will, you know, pr prompt this by saying uh, I, I'm a seven and, you know, ones integrate to seven, meaning at their best when things are going well and they can relax the inner critic and relax that voice, uh, you know, in their head that's constantly berating them and challenging them to step up to the plate and do better. When, when, seven, when ones can relax that voice a little bit, they will look a little bit like a seven in some ways. Um, maybe more fluid thinking, more positive, um, you know, able to uh, have a little more joy in the moment. And um, I will also say that I grew up in a home with a uh, type one brother. My older brother is a one wing nine. And so, uh, you know, my from the time I was born, you know, I was watching and living with this one energy. My mom is probably a six wing five. She's passed away. My dad's passed away. He's probably a five wing six. And I've got a younger brother uh, who's deaf, who is a six wing seven, and I'm a seven wing six. Uh, and my older brother is a one wing nine. So I don't have any ones in my family now. Um, we have five kids and my wife's a two wing one, uh, but um, we don't have any ones in our family yet. But you know, families are always growing and expanding and we have grandkids now and uh, not all of our kids are married. So there's a good chance that before it's all over with, uh, there'll be another one in, in close relationship with me in that family setting. But like I said, I grew up, you know, playing ball and and um, watching TV and going, uh, you know, working on cars and all the things that brothers do, I grew up with this one wing nine brother. And so I experienced much of what the author is going to say. Uh, I experienced it secondhand. So let's, enough about me. Let's jump into what the, uh, the book says. Now, you know, I mean, as ones, you guys understand that you have this inner critic that basically is telling you, you need to grow up. Uh, you can't be a child. And just think how different that is than, you know, maybe what the seven heard that you should be a child as long as possible. Um, you know, and sevens can be very childlike, sometimes maybe even childish, but ones, uh, you know, you got to grow up. You can't be a child. You have to uh, be mature and responsible and vigilant and diligent and have integrity and all these wonderful things. I mean, all these things are great. 
And every seven, for example, needs a lot more of that balance uh, with one, just like one needs a little bit of sevenness. All right, so um, maybe this is something she says in the book here at the beginning of her chapter. She says, when you're in touch with your true nature, what you might not recognize yet is there's nothing that you really need to make happen or fix in order to experience the sweet nature of goodness. Um, and okay, I kind of understand what she's saying is that like, you know, you're working really hard to be good, but the reality is, is you are good. Like you're a good, good person by, by the expectations or the standards of the people around you. Most people would probably see you as a very good guy or a very good lady, good girl, good woman, a good person, good human. And, you know, you're working really hard to sort of attain this perspective of yourself that everybody already sees you as being this good guy, you know, this good person. Um, now, let's look at what she says here in this. This is where this section actually begins down here with like the story of your life. She says, from your earliest childhood years, you tried so hard to be good, but it often felt like you couldn't be as good as you needed to be. So there's this standard, you know, whether it was, you know, externalized by a teacher or by parents, by your dad, um, you know, your coach, you had this standard and everybody has this standard. Everybody understands that there is a standard, but just notice how it was maybe a little more important to you to try to reach that standard or to, to, to make an effort to try to reach that standard. As you grew, you sensed that you were expected to assume a great deal of responsibility. And I think that's a key word with one's, you know, being responsible and not wanting to be irresponsible. And you may see a lot of other people, <coughs> like us sevens, for example, and maybe some nines as, you know, being irresponsible, not taking responsibility for ourselves. <coughs> and that's a, you know, that's something that all of us need to learn. All of us need a little more responsibility. By the way, in my tri-type, I believe I'm a 712. I used to think I was a 714, but I, I've come to believe I'm a 712. Uh, so I have that in my tri-type. I'm also a counter seven, which pushes against that seven freedom, you know, to be responsible and to be a good person. So I get it a little bit. Okay. But my, but, but my volume on that is not turned as up as, as yours is. And that you needed to live up to a certain standard. Uh, you may have heard the message that, you know, you could do better. Uh, you should do better. Or that's not right. You need to work harder to get it right. And again, all of us heard that message. I mean, how you know, as kids growing up, you know, we're going to hear that message. It's just maybe we didn't internalize it to the degree that you did um, because you are one. So in other words, you highlighted that part of the story as being more important than perhaps the rest of us did. Because think like, for example, fours, um, you know, I must live by um, what I believe, what I think, what is right for me. That's much stronger with fours than it is with ones, where ones are looking for that external standard. And then I need to comply with that external standard. That needs to become my standard. And then you internalize that. Remember, at, at, at the heart of this, ones, twos, and sixes are compliant types. Um, and part of that is I need to comply with these expectations or demands and internalize them and make them my own. Okay. You internalized the expe expectations and took it on yourself to see what needed to be fixed and then to show up and make an effort to fix that. Again, this is great. Nothing wrong with this. Again, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just when it's overplayed, um, when you end up taking responsibility for things that maybe aren't your responsibility or feeling a sense of responsibility, burden, you might say, for things that really aren't yours. Uh, and so you can't relax, you can't rest, you can't have any kind of peace, or it may be difficult to have any kind of peace because you've taken it upon yourself to go out there in the world and repair and fix everything. And this feels right to you. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's a hard thing to live up to. 
It's going to take its toll on you and it's eventually going to express itself as anger or frustration or irritability, which is going to damage your relationships with other people and maybe move you away from the very things that you really want to pursue in life. In other words, again, we come back to this principle that we learn in the Enneagram is your fundamental motivations can sometimes, you know, disrupt your, your, your stated goals for your life or the fundamental goals that you have of your type can sometimes thwart, interrupt, or create conflict in you accomplishing what you said that you wanted to accomplish in life. Your stated goals. Even when you were young, you followed certain procedures or internal rules to lessen the possibility of error. It was hard to meet your own standards and you got frustrated uh, when others didn't look like they were trying as hard as you. <laughs> right. So notice you become like a little bit of a police officer or a, you know, a monitor of others' behaviors. And, you know, that, by the way, is probably a great job for uh, that type one mindset. You, if, you, if you sit down and watch, you know, popular television shows like CSI or NCIS or Law and Order or, you know, Blue Bloods or any of these dramas, you know, these evening dramas made for TV, you are no doubt going to find somewhere in that show a character who's a one. You just will. Uh, you're going to find a one, you'll probably find a nine, you'll probably find an eight, uh, maybe a six, but you're, and then maybe a seven to provide some kind of chaos in the, in the storyline, but you're going to find a one. I mean, this is Commissioner Gordon, you know, I mean, this is the energy of the police chief. This is the energy of the, or police officer, maybe not the chief. The chief might be a, an eight, but, uh, the police officer, the, um, okay. All right. So. You may have looked to your father or your father figure for guidance. Um, however, that person may have been very strict or too strict or maybe too lax. And so maybe the guidance that you were looking for was absent. And so you started to set your own boundaries uh, and in effect started policing yourself. And again, you can end up very hard on yourself and then sometimes take on the responsibility that it's your responsibility to police others. Um, you were hard on yourself and punished yourself before anyone else could punish you um, or tell you that you were doing something wrong. And so notice like the tendency is, I always say it like this, like I'm gonna yell at myself so that no one else has to yell at me. I kind of have this, you know, idea of like how every type gets along with the angry father, you know, and ones is, um, I, I'm going to yell at myself so dad doesn't have to. Um, and that, that's just this, you know, tremendous amount of stress or burden, which we all appreciate. It's not a bad thing to police yourself. It's not a bad thing to strive to be good. It's not a bad thing to be responsible. All these things are great. It's just notice they could be overplayed a little bit. Uh, to the point that you, you know, become so critical of yourself or so harsh with yourself that you may not realize, like, maybe you, you could lighten up a little bit. Like, everybody would appreciate it if you could lean into nine and look a little more like a seven, you know, or be more a little bit more like a two, more loving and kind and friendly. And that line to four even isn't necessarily always bad of of asking yourself, like, what's meaningful to me? If I, if I didn't show up in the world today to do all the things that needed to be done, in other words, if I, if I didn't comply as strongly with all the things that need to be done, what would I do that's meaningful to me? I think that's kind of like a four. And then think like that seven, what would I do that would just, that I would enjoy? And you may not, see, that's the whole thing, is you may not feel like you have permission, or it's hard to give yourself permission to do something today that isn't what needs to be done. To just kind of let that list go and relax that that voice and that, that inner sense of responsibility for just a moment and maybe take care of yourself and uh, spend some time without feeling guilty about you know doing something that you would enjoy or doing something that feels meaningful to you. Okay, um, you were hard on yourself and punished yourself before anyone else could punish you or tell you that you were doing something wrong. And you put enormous energy into trying to be beyond error itself. 
And you know, let's just ask ourselves, is that really possible? Is that really possible to get to a point where there is nothing uh, ever thought or done in word or deed or action, you know, that is incorrect or unwholesome? It's probably not really possible, um, you know, at least from my worldview. And I, again, I have a very simple worldview, a Christian worldview that looks at at one time in the Garden of Eden, yes, we all lived up to the standard. You know, we all were perfect in a perfect environment. Uh, but now, you know, the, everything has changed and the world is broken and all of us are broken. And, you know, it's a great standard to try to reach up to, to be perfect. Uh, but is it possible? Is it really possible? Um, and accepting that it's not possible, and that may be even hard for you to accept that, but accepting that it's not possible to be perfect all the time. And even that, how are you defining perfect? Who sets your standard for you? Where do you get your sense of good and right? Is it just, you know, internal? Um, or is there an external standard by which you try to comply? Good deep questions. I mean, this is deep philosophical stuff that I just want you to pause and just analyze this process a little bit, okay? So you put enormous in trying to be beyond error itself and become very critical of yourself and others um, because it was very painful for someone to reprimand you. Someone to look at you and say, all right, let's knock it off. Or, all right, settle down, settle down, cool it. That's kind of my dad, the way he would you know, get aggravated and express that. And that just feels very awful, very painful for somebody to say, get over here, <laughs> get over here. You know, that just feels like, Ugh, I don't want to be a bad person. I don't want to be a bad kid. I don't want dad to be mad at me. I don't want mom to be disappointed. Just think about that whole word disappointed, how, how that, what kind of feelings that brings about in you. Um, there are other people, you know, that just feel like, I don't care if you're disappointed. Like, I'm not trying to make you proud of me. Like, I don't need that. Um, in attempts to be helpful to others, you have a tendency or had a tendency to maybe be a little hard on others or to be critical with others. You would see it as I'm helping them. Don't they want to know? Don't they want to know the right way to do this or how they're messing everything up? <laughs> Uh, but it might come across as very critical, which is so interesting, isn't it? Because criticism is one of the things that you want to move away from. Like, you, how does it feel when people criticize you? It feels awful. And yet, if you're not careful, you could become the most critical person in your world. With the desire to be helping other people, you know, it might actually just look like you're being very critical and harsh and inflexible with people. Even now, you may sometimes feel like you're the only one in the room who's trying to do right, the only adult in the room. And notice under stress, you look a little bit like a four, not fitting in, not belonging, not a part of the group, misunderstood. How am I the problem? I'm the only one that's really trying to make things right here. Your life became organized around. Just listen to that concept, organized around. Like what's the core? What's the center? What is the you know, the compass, your life became organized around the concept or the necessity of being right and uh, making things right because it's simply intolerable for you to make a mistake or worse, to be criticized as this only reinforced your sense of being wrong or bad. Um, well, and again, where does this sense of being wrong or bad come from? Now, there'd be people who would argue with me and say, no, everybody's good, you know, and then they may do bad things. But from a Christian worldview, I mean, we're fallen creatures. We, we sinned in the garden and we've been kicked out of the garden. And fundamentally, we are flawed or marred by this uh, propensity to sin and to offend God and to sin against each other. And so notice how this is like hyper-focused on, though. Um, and like, I don't want to be, I don't want to think of myself as bad or wrong. And just, you know, the good news is there's grace, there's mercy, there's forgiveness. But this created a lot of constraints and tenseness in your body. Tenseness, you know, in your body. You have spent much of your life trying to be good. Because it's hard to see yourself 
as a good person. And maybe you don't really see the good. Like threes, you know how they accomplish a lot, but then they don't really celebrate it. They just move on to the next goal. You, you may kind of do that with goodness or rightness or responsibility. Like if you did step up to the plate and you did come through for your company and everybody turns and says, wow, Mark, great job. You really saved the day. There's probably a sense in you of like, well, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. I was just doing what anybody would do. I was just doing what any concerned citizen would do. Uh, there, it may be hard for you to just take a minute and just like celebrate. Hey, I did a good thing. Hey, I, saw, I saved the day. I was responsible. I had integrity. I made a good decision. I showed up and got my work done. And now I can relax and celebrate this and have some joy and some serenity and some peace. That may be hard for you to like really stay in that moment of I did a good thing. People are happy with me. People are proud of me. It may feel like you shouldn't, you know, enjoy that. Like it would be wrong for you, like shameful for you to like occupy that space for too long yet if you did everybody would just feel so much relaxed around you they'd be like look he's happy you know mark is happy sam is happy and content and peaceful and notice that that two or that nine that seven all these numbers all all those energies kind of you know are so good for you Remember this idea, like, you want to hear the wisdom of all the other types. Yes, one is a legitimate Enneagram type. And you got so much goodness and wisdom to share with the rest of us. But there are eight other ways of seeing the world. Eight other perspectives. Eight other voices out there. And think, just start with the ones you're connected to. What would seven tell a one? You know, what would nine tell a one? What would two tell a one? What kind of wisdom would four give to one? You say, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Well, let me just let me just do the seven one, okay? A seven might look to a one and say, look, you, you do a lot of things that are just brilliant. You do a lot of things that are great. And I should be more like you in many ways. But, you know, I have a lot of wisdom to share with you. You say, what kind of wisdom would a seven give to a one? Well, let me just, let me just ask you this. Um, you know, I, I, are you able to make happiness a goal for your life? What are you doing right now to just move toward a more happy or positive experience in life? You say, well, what's the value in that? Well, remember sevens at their core, you know, are driven toward happiness and joy and excitement and enthusiasm and passion and living with passion and enthusiasm and joy and happy. Okay. And you may look at that and say, that's not as noble as trying to do the right thing, as trying to be responsible, as trying to be, you know, having integrity. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm not arguing that one is worth more than the other. I just want you to hear from a seven, this simple wisdom of when you get to a point in your life and you realize that you you don't have any happiness just remember that was never your goal you never set that as a goal you never you never were trying to move toward happiness like it wasn't a priority to you and now that here you are in your 40s or your 50s and you feel very unhappy just remember that wasn't a priority for you. Why would you feel happy? You never went toward anything that would bring you happiness. That was not as important to you as doing the right thing or being responsible. And you can do the same thing with nine. When you get to a point in your life when you don't have any peace or harmony in your life or harmony or peace or comfort in your relationships, just remember that you never made that your priority in life. You, you weren't making decisions based on what would bring you harmony. You weren't trying to interact in a way that would bring peace or comfort into your relationship. So why would you have it? Why would you be surprised that you don't have any happiness or peace in your life? Or love. Look at type two. When you get to a point in your life and you realize that you're missing love, like you don't feel love, you don't feel loved by others, like love just seems missing, remember that was not your priority. And look how, look how, look how this forces you and all of us to 
to balance a little more. Like to hear that to neighbor and say, wow, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Maybe sometimes I should just shut my mouth in order to show love. Maybe the most loving thing I can do sometimes is to stop preaching at people and just to love them for who they are. Look how, oh, look how powerful this is. And listen to that nine neighbor. You know, sometimes the best thing I can do is just try to understand somebody else's perspective and, and work toward keeping peace and harmony with them. Like that may be the best good I could do. And it's learning to listen to these other types, the wisdom of the, of the entire Enneagram, you know, and not just so stuck in our own way of seeing things. Wow, it's so good. So good. I love it so much. All right. Um, what you didn't see in yourself was your own inherent goodness. Um, that's hard for you to see. You didn't realize that being a human includes making mistakes. And I've got a whole class on demand on this, on giving up on being perfect or giving up on, imperf on, on perfection. You didn't know that uh, what may seem like imperfection or doing the wrong thing is not a reflection of some deep-rooted flaw in you, but is a part of being a human now. It's part of the natural flow of life is we mess up, we make mistakes, it's part of it. And you know what's funny is you'd be the first one to share this lesson with other people. Yet notice how hard it is for you to like accept this lesson for yourself. Like if, if you had the opportunity to sit down with somebody younger than you who's trying to make it in life, you'd be the first one to say, you know what, you're not always going to get it right. And you know, you need to just shake it off and move on and just accept the fact you're the first one to share that life lesson. But notice how hard it is for you maybe to internalize that and to give yourself some grace, to give yourself some mercy and to see yourself you know, in the light, even when you've blown it or, you know, messed things up. You can, you can trust your strong inner compass to guide you in following your higher purpose and savoring the joys of life. Notice how she works that word joy in there. And what do you think of when you think of joy? You think seven, right? Integrating to seven. So, you know, what do we want to say? Let's wrap this up. Well, there's this sense, you know, that ones more than any other type understand the fall from grace that's happened from the garden and that something is essentially wrong in us and that, but then they like get this idea, like we got to work really hard to overcome this. We got to work really hard to, to, to against this. Um, so the core belief, you know, in you is something's wrong with me. Something's wrong with the world. This needs to be fixed. This needs to be corrected. This needs to be made right. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I think biblically that's, that's, that's true. It's just, it's not all on you to fix everything. You remember, there is a savior and that savior is not you. Um, not that we don't work hard to make the world better. It's just, remember, there's a higher, uh, a higher plan than just your plan. And there's a higher force at work than just you. Okay. So I'm not hard on myself and keep correcting myself and something ugly will pop up. I'm going to do one last thing here. She talks about this just really helpful. She says, as a one, I pursue, I avoid, and I cope. Okay. I pursue doing what is right. And that will result in me being a good person. And I, I see what needs to be improved. And I put a lot of energy into making it right. I avoid being wrong or being criticized, which makes me feel like a bad person. If I keep myself in check, correcting myself um, and others to avoid the internal experience that I'm at fault and therefore guilty or bad. I cope by being on a mission. The mission is supported by having right standards and opinions about how things could be improved and being responsible for making things better. And that's great. Make things better. I mean, by all means, you teach the rest of us. You know, think when you join the team, you share a message with the rest of us. If you could relax that message a little bit on yourself and then share that message with the world, you're living your purpose. You know, share that message. Tom, you're doing a great job, but you know, this could be improved. This could be better. This could be enhanced. You know, that's a great message. It's a great place to be on the team. If you can just bring it down a little bit. And, you know, not end up with that explosive energy, the volcano. Um, you're not responsible for fixing the world. Uh, but you can make it better. Uh, and you can't fix yourself. So don't hear all this like, oh, wow, now i got to fix myself. No, it's more about catching yourself and catching your patterns and then softening that voice a little bit, 
pushing back a little on those impulses and you know recognizing that it's okay to be happy it's okay to be content in fact it's a good thing and people will find me a lot easier to be around you know if i could relax this inner critic a little bit think you know it when you show up at work with this critical perfectionistic mindset yeah it it helps you you're a good manager you're a great accountant you're a great police officer you're a great teacher right but just nobody wants to go on vacation with that. Nobody wants to go on vacation with somebody who's always pointing out how things are wrong, who's always disappointed. And let me just end with one of my favorite authors, Dr. Richard Carlson, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, which I think Dr. Carlson's probably a nine wing one. He's passed away now, but um, his, his tone just seems like the nine wing one beautiful tone, right? So it's like a one, but softer. It's like a one, but you know, gentle. And one of the things that he says that just stuck in my mind is it's so, it's so great to be around someone who isn't bothered by something all the time. And they just, what would Winnie the Pooh say to Rabbit, right? What would a nine say to a one? Or what would Winnie the Pooh say to Piglet, to a six? You know, it's so great to be around somebody who isn't bothered by something all the time. And if you're not careful, you know, you could come across as the person who's bothered by something all the time. And that could disrupt many of the wonderful things in life that you want. Relationships, marriage, family relationships, you know. Um, so we're all working at this. We're all growing together. We all need to listen to each other. And let me just end by saying I respect so much that one position, that one energy. You know, I try really hard to internalize and have 712. I try to internalize that do the right thing, be responsible. Um, you know, and, uh, I think all of us should hear that voice a little more. Just maybe you could soften it a little bit on yourself. All right, guys, as always, thank you for, you know, checking out this video. I hope the information is helpful. I'm here for you if you want to talk and as always be present to life and remember ones, four, sevens, we are the disappointment types. And, uh, sometimes we can be disappointed with the way things are and not really fully show up to the way things are, um, because we, they don't live up to our ideal expectations. So let's be present to life. Let's go out there and make a difference, but let's soften ourselves and try to understand other people, be a little more compassionate, loving, joyful, peaceful, and live for meaning in our life. Thanks guys. I'll see you next time.